There is a ton of really great content on YouTube about improving your game, both from the, the perspective of a GM and the perspective of a, an actual player. Um, and there's a lot of stuff, when you look at like tips on role playing, there's a lot of stuff on mechanical stuff and simulation aspects. I've done a lot of that stuff myself. Um, but there's not a lot of advice out there for role playing a better character. Uh, like how to make a character that's really memorable, and how to make a character um, that you know everyone wants you to keep playing, that everyone at the table kind of falls in love with and, 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 and adores. And I think, I guess a lot of that's because people always feel that, you know, if you make a video saying how to make a great character, um, then at the same time, you, whenever you play a character, you kind of expect it to make a great character, right? Because um, not every character I have created has been epic. Uh, some characters haven't worked. Um, you know, I try things, I experiment, and uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll try a new idea out and see if it, see if it's good. Um, and that sometimes means characters aren't good. Uh, or I'm just another person. You know, when I do conference games, uh, the worst characters that I, I play uh, are usually when I go to a conference game and uh, they've got pre-generated characters and so you have to kind of act this character as, as either as detailed or, or you have to make a personality for this character constrained by things that you kind of don't necessarily like or don't, you know, you kind of work out how it goes together and it's like, I'm not seeing this person because they haven't, you know, uh, filled in the blanks and and sometimes sometimes it just doesn't mesh for you and, and, and stuff um, and yeah that's happened to me too uh, but I'm I'm still gonna have a go at doing uh, a video on role playing better on making better characters because on the flip side of that I've also had uh, entire tables say to me after the game that that character is fantastic how did you come up with it uh, and uh, even people on adjacent tables. Um, so I've had successful characters too um, and so I kind of want to sort of break down some of what I do when I make my good characters. Um, and one of the first things I think is it's all about the entrance because uh, some of the greatest characters I've had, some of the ones that I've had the most applause from other players um, they've all had amazing entrances. Uh, I remember one in a conference game where I was, it was a Monster Hearts game, uh, and we made the characters ourselves, it doesn't take long in Monster Hearts. Uh, we made the characters ourselves, uh, I made the ghoul character, and the thing about the ghoul character is the ghoul character uh, has the option to, or one of the things you can take as the ghoul, and, and I did take this, was you can die and come back to life. Um, and so I thought, I could use that. But I didn't think about this in the way a power gamer would, like, ah, a character that can't be killed. No, I, I thought I could be suicidal. You know, take it to the extreme. It's kind of, um, there's, a, there's a marketeer, uh, I should know his name, I've made books of his and everything, uh, as the industry I work in. Um, I'm not a marketeer myself, I'm a programmer, but uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, he, anyway, this guy who talks about Edgecraft, and, and when he talks about it, oh, and it's, it's frustrating me now, why can't I remember it? I remember the name of the book it was in, it's free prize inside. I may have to Google this. Oh, he's a famous man in my industry. Hang on. Seth Godin. So, uh, he, he came up with this idea of Edgecraft, where you take an idea, and you either, you either, you know, or take, take a product, you remove a feature from it, or you add a feature. Um, and then you take it to the extreme when you market it, you know, and it's push it right to the very boundaries. You know, if you've got a car, make it the fastest car. If you've got a car, make it the safest car. Make it the most dangerous car. You know, whatever. As long as it's extreme. You know, take it right to the edge, as far as you can go, and then further. Um, so, this, this concept of edge, and so when I saw that ability, what I saw was, like, a character that can't be killed. What if she tries to kill herself, you know? Um, so, what happened was, and, and Monster Hearts, it, it should be explained, it's, it's kind of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's all about, you know, the teenagers 
being different, coping with school and sexual tension, um, you know, first section encounters, that kind of thing. It's, it's about that stuff. So, um, during character creation, uh, something occurred, but basically I became a ghoul because I was I died in the Victorian era. Uh, one of the other characters was the person who had raised me from the dead, um, but it hadn't quite gone right, and I'd come out as a ghoul, not as not as a resurrected person. Um, so, I I uh, I had as part of the, the creation, I had a crush on this character. I, I had a love for him um, that he didn't reciprocate. <laughs> so the GM had a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of playground scene where he goes off actually with the Slayer um, uh, in, in the group. So he, he goes off with the Slayer because the, to investigate something after registration is taken. And, and my character's all jealous in the playground. So where's he off to? Where is Tristan going? That's with her. With her. She can't be going with her. He, why would... Oh, he... They could, the, ah, uh, so I followed them uh, from a distance, uh, and then they go inside this house, and I'm like, oh my God. he's gone in the house with her. He has gone in the house with her. that bitch. Ah, uh, right, I need to get his attention. I've got to do something to get his attention. And then I see a lorry coming, and I run in front of the lorry, get run over, ha Oh, you know, a lorry going, boom, I die. Uh, so there's all this commotion outside to try and get him out of the house. And that was my entrance. It was the first decisive scene that my character had had. Um, so uh, it wasn't the first time I appeared, but, you know, the, the first time you say something and you interact and you're kind of warming up and, and it might be, you know, open the door or whatever you know and it, it might not be that dramatic so the first opportunity I had for a dramatic scene I took that I took the idea from character creation um, and used it um, uh, later on in the game uh, I attempted a further suicide by throwing myself out of the window um, one of the things in the game the slayer gets healed by having sex so I'd have sex with the slayer uh, threw myself out the window, but she has to save people, so she saved me, but ended up going out the window herself and lost all the hit points that she'd set with me to heal. So, <laughs> but great moment, you know, it was very, very amusing for everyone. Um, the, uh, so yeah, make an entrance, plan your entrance, you know, take, with, in that case I took a character aspect and, and kind of ran with it. Um, with thanks to the Rogue DM, uh, I've got some footage here of an adventure I was playing in, uh, which she recorded that game. So um, this is my character's entrance from that game. So you all head down the elevator and the others patiently wait for it to get to the bottom. And as you hear a bing! I immediately step into the door, uh -huh. use my arms to uh, to put my arms out to hold the doors open, so I'm stood to prevent the doors from shutting, and I'm mm -hmm. going to initiate my aspect. Um, cannot take a life without monologuing first. <laughs> All right. Eight point, please. Oh, right. Okay, so you take a point. Okay. So, let me tell you why I wear white. I wear white because... I like to look at myself in the mirror after I've taken a life and see the blood. You see, blood is anonymous. Blood can be anyone. And I like to remember everyone whose life I've taken. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to remember you forever. Okay, okay I'm going to disappear. For the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Be surprised for a second. Alright. Um, okay. Uh, cut. Because you did that amazing monologue, I'm going to let you take the life instantly of the nearest person to you without having to roll. So there's a grand entrance, right? Um, that one actually got even better when one of the other characters had this ability. It was all about, his ability was all about darkness. 
um, I was playing this ghost, you know, the, the white lady of the ghost. Um, so of course what he did is he used his, his he, he blew the lights. Um, so I just gave this monologue, killed the first person, and then the lights went out, uh, which is like the perfect entrance, it just really worked for me, that one. Um, so, yeah, make an entrance. Uh, I, that, again, that wasn't the first thing I'd said in that adventure, but it was the first decisive moment. Up until then, the other characters had done more of this kind of running around, just figuring out what we were meant to do. Um, and I kind of just waited my time. I, I knew I was going to do this monologue, and I knew that that would be my entrance. Um, that's why I, I put in Fate You Create, You Have Aspects. I had this aspect, uh, cannot take a life without monologuing first. Now, I hadn't figured out exactly what I would say. Um, I just knew roughly what it would be. It would be about blood and anonymous, meaning I could remember everyone. Uh, because it's not distinctive to any one person and I'd be covered in their blood, you know. I, that was kind of all I really knew. So I kind of just sort of sat there, sort of plotting out roughly how this monologue would go and, uh, whilst listening to the game. Um, and, you know, when the moment came, I, I took it. I took it and I delivered it. Uh, being a monologue, you know, I, just like anyone who, who does public speak, I stood up and projected um, in order to really deliver that home. And uh, I think it, it worked, you know, you can see the reaction on the other players, it really worked. Um, to the extent that uh, on a completely, un well it wasn't completely unrelated, but uh, on another video, somebody uh, who was in the game actually called the white lady strikes again, you know. Um, it was a memorable character to them. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's a great way to get a character going because when you when you can make an an entrance that really delivers impact, you win over the hearts and minds of the other players at that moment and establish who your character is, who they really are. And it doesn't have to be the very first thing, as I said. Uh, it doesn't have to be the very first thing you do, but it should be the first decisive thing you do. So um, in this case, an encounter was about to start where uh, we were about to kill a lot of people. Um, so that's the moment I chose to, to make my impact. Um, with, with my ghoul character, uh, I, I created that moment. I waited for a good opportunity to do that suicide and you know, had that impact on, on the game. Um, you know, and I spent most of the game, you know, I was kind of like, you know, arming and arming over this relationship and, and you know, this, this relationship that my character felt that she had, this possessive, I, you know, love this man, and then he, he, I, I don't think my character even knew that it, it wasn't reciprocated uh, right up until she selected the Slayer. Um, so, you know, it's, it make, make a splash, start off with a bang. Um, actually, uh, yeah, well, part two, okay, the second thing. Um, I remember when I was reading the D&D 5th edition rules, I was kind of both disappointed and inspired, because one of the things I'd always done when I played 1st edition uh, is I always had something to my character that was unique to that character, and again I would edgecraft it. So, um, oh, <laughs> I'll try and think of some now, because of course I haven't played 1st edition in so long. Uh, oh, the last, the last, actually, the last time I played first edition, I was playing two characters at once. Um, so I was playing this really, really miserable cleric. Uh, she hated life. She hated everything. Uh, she was basically she was jealous of her sister. And I was also playing her sister. It was a druid. Her sister was really, really shy. Uh, the characters only met the sister um, after the about three game weeks into the adventure um, because she spent the entire time either invisible or hiding as an animal. They didn't even know for sure if she was really in the party. All they knew is that the cleric referenced her from time to time. Um, they, they, they didn't know if it was some kind of psychosis my cleric had. Is there really a sister? <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, again, it's just taking that aspect and sort of pushing it as far as it'll go, 
Um, and that was something I'd always done. And one of the things I was kind of like when fifth edition came out and it introduced it, it introduced four character things. It you know, everyone had a flaw, everyone had a bond, everyone had an ideal, everyone had a personality trait. And it was sort of like, well, I only usually do the one, you know? <laughs> well, maybe I've not been doing it right all these years. Um, I think I had, uh, now that I've played 5th edition a bit and I've seen how those, you know, things pan out. And kind of like having one of each kind of, it's a bit formulaic. Um, sometimes it's better to have, you know, just sort of focus on one or two of those. Um, and I think one of the key things is, is to make a really memorable character, um, you kind of have to do the opposite power gaming. It kind of, you have to take some trait that is in some way negative. Because um, flawed characters are more interesting. Uh, I'm playing this game in Numenera. Numenera. Uh, I have this character called Edge, because when, when the game started I had no idea if it was fantasy or sci-fi or anything like that. And when I didn't know the world, I, I hadn't even read the book. Uh, the GM had just got the book, it was the Kickstarter book when it first arrived. Just got, I want to run this game. I'm like, okay, well, you know, what's the setting? It's kind of, well, it's kind of complicated. Well, let's start with the simple one. Is it fantasy or sci-fi? It's complicated. <laughs> I knew nothing about this game. Um, so I kind of, I saw on the back of his, I think he had the GM screen at first, did he? I can't remember. Maybe it was on the cover of the book, but the the the, the female wearing purple with the crossbow on the book. So I thought, right, I'll kind of play that character then, all purple. And I looked at the character sheet and, and I'll call her Edge. <laughs> because I didn't know what I was playing. Um, as we got into the game and the character developed and, um, you know, and I was able to start introducing some personality to her, um, one of the things that, that's uh, transpired about those is, is she has an absolute messiah complex. She thinks, she wants to be a hero. She wants to be the most famous person in all the world. Um, and I, I've fleshed out this bit of background with the GM. It's not common knowledge to anyone in the game world, but... Uh, turns out she's the sister of uh, the the Amber Pope, which is the like the most powerful person in the world, and she ran away um, because she resented. You know, she was, Amber Pope wanted her to marry for politics, and she hated that world. She wants to be better than her brother. Well, how to be better than the most famous, most powerful person in all the world is to be a hero that's more famous. So she's obsessed with becoming famous and doing heroic deeds purely for the reason of the fame. She doesn't do it because she's good. She wants to be recognised for doing these things, which adds this dynamic to the game where she's much more about shouting out how brilliant she is. Um, and, and she is brilliant. She goes and saves the world. But she's, she's got to make sure everyone knows that she's done it. Um, and it's, it's an interesting and fascinating character. But we've been playing that, that's a campaign game, we've been playing that a while. And uh, that's been a huge disadvantage to her in social interactions that she uh, has worked against her a number of times, where people have just basically taken a dislike to her. Which, the way she sees it, I mean, that wouldn't even be a problem to her, because, well, if people dislike her, as long as they remember her, you know, she just wants to be famous. So, um, but... What I, really, what, what I want to do now, because that game's gone on for a year, I haven't played the last few months of GM's away on business, but uh, as the game goes forward, I want to evolve this character. Because that's something that's really, really important and gets so often overlooked. Is And it kind of falls into that old trope of, my character wouldn't do that. You know, no, no, no. Um, which, you know, it's fine to do that once at the start, but, well, it kind of isn't. I always hate that saying. But... Um, you know, your character at the start of the campaign should be different to the character at the end. Your character needs to evolve. Um, and that can only really happen if you, if the players can literally perceive that evolution to happen um, through a combination of defining moments and, and kind of being in the same circumstances, not necessarily the same situation, but being in the same circumstances and having learned from the first time where things didn't go brilliantly. Um, 
And it's something that I'm actually going to talk to the GM about because I want to start evolving that trait, that desire for fame to make her realise that what she's doing is she's pushing people away from her and that she wants not just to be famous but she's going she's gonna to want to be loved as well as she's starting to accrue fame it's the wrong kind of fame and now and then she'll start evolving the kind of fame that she actually wants and start changing her personality to try and make that happen um, so that that evolution of the character is as important as the character itself you can't you know it's great to come up with this fantastic concept but if the character never changes through years of play and the only thing that really changes is some stats get bigger um, then that's not a character, that's not a story. And this is a storytelling exercise, right? Role playing is about telling a story. So uh, you have to evolve your character through a campaign. Um, so, and the best way to, I think, to evolve a character is, is it kind of needs, it needs GM uh, interaction. Um, because you need those moments for a start, you need moments that help define your character uh, and help shape your character and evolve them. Um, and you need to work with your GM to explain what you want to achieve so that they can, you know, you can agree the right kind of circumstances or situations for those evolutions to happen. Um, so, yeah, evolve your character. Um, one of the things I, I really uh, I always come back to this, and I'm going to find this video. Yeah, this is an excellent video um, by a guy called Kurt Vonnegut, uh, deceased now. He was a journalist. Uh, not journalist, uh, he was a writer. Uh, he was quite famous. Uh, I, uh, but he did this brilliant video on the shapes of stories. Uh, I'll play that now. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers, they are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now this is the BE axis. B stands for beginning, E stands for electricity. <laughs> now, this is an exercise in relativity, really, is the shape of the curves are what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average, is why, why get a depressing person? We'll start... <coughs> the whole thing, we call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man, and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. <laughs> they never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story, also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Got it back again. People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. Is Computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. 
You've heard it. <laughs> See? Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum quack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. She, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her <laughs> mascara. <laughs> gives her means of transportation. Goes to the party, dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now, there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fits. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> Very clever guy. Um, and those kind of arcs, I use them a lot as a GM. Uh, so, you know, uh, starting off typical adventure, um, they get into trouble, <laughs> they get out of it again. Uh, starting off on a typical adventure, oh hey, we got some loot, it's all going well, this is easy, ah, oh, fantastic, oh dear. We find a way out again. Um, uh, every now and then, you know, the Cinderella thing, um, which is tough to do because, you know, you've, you've, you've got to put the players in a bad spot to begin with. Uh, but they work. They work. I use them as a GM and they work. Uh, but you can use them with your characters as well. Um, uh, and uh, I would argue that maybe a good GM should, it's just that it's very hard to do multiple storylines at once for multiple players. It's a lot of work for a GM to do that, you know, to have individual storylines for players. Um, I've, I've been doing it with my players in the campaign I'm running at the moment, 5th edition campaign. Uh, it's a good effect, they've all got their own storylines. Um, and yeah, story arcs and traditional story shapes, I mean that that's a traditional story shape for a written book, um, and those shapes are classic shapes that worked for centuries when telling stories. Role playing is telling stories. Now I know some people disagree with the whole concept of using story arcs. Uh, sometimes I, I just use to to influence balance. You know, if I'm trying to run the Cinderella, so balance um, the adrenaline, adrenaline moments versus role playing moments and things like that. Uh, if you're doing the Cinderella arc, then I'll. I'll you know, it's, it's good fortune, bad fortune. You can do, you can take any aspect with them. Um, and, yeah, in many ways it's more for the GM than for the player. Uh, but as a player, to be aware of it. Uh, to be aware of... It, movies often use the, uh, the three-act system. You know, crescendo, crescendo uh, every act and uh, so on. Um, so... Yeah, you know, you use use traditional story writing tools uh, because storytelling is one of the oldest traditions in the world, and the techniques developed in that ancient tradition are absolutely valid to your storytelling hobby because <laughs> it's the oldest tradition in the world. It's a science out there. You can learn so much by by reading up on this stuff. Um, so yeah. Um, in terms of your character, that, that, uh, you know, I, I, I have those, there's kind of like two big tips in this video, and that's those, those two. Uh, and I will do more, uh, I hope in the future where, where I sort of bring some more tips to it. Um, but I, I think I'll leave it there for now. Uh, and, you know, fill out the comments, rant at me for doing, saying something you disagree with, or, um, uh, you know, or, or say, yeah, that's great ideas, and tell me how they those ideas worked for you in your games. Um, I think I'll talk more on uh,
personality traits and how to come up with them and you know, uh, you know more. I, I will do another video on this topic in the future. Uh, got some other stuff to do first, but this isn't the end. Unless everyone hates it and I get loads of downloads. No, don't do that. Give me up there. Because then I'll do more. Uh, I'll reveal more of my role playing secrets. Um, yeah. Oh, and if you're not one of my subscribers, <laughs> you're so cruel to me. And if you are one of my subscribers, thank you for subscribing. I'm a total narcissist and it really means a lot to me. See, I managed to do that without asking anyone to subscribe as well. That was, that was smooth. That was. Okay, so until my next video, um, role play lots. Of, I, I need a catchphrase. It's not happened to me yet. Catchphrases should evolve naturally. Maybe I'll plot one for my next video, see if I can, no. Hmm. Okay. Time to sign off.